but we will come We'll continue. We were talking about insurance and the slides there. Just a moment, please. So, okay, oh, we got disconnected. And uh, now that we are back, we were talking about the introduction to the insurance laws. I was talking about insurance contracts, saying that there are two parties in an insurance contract, that is the insurer and the insured, where the insurer agrees to insure the insured for a particular sum of money in ex for a particular consideration that is uh, a premium where the, insur the insured pays to the insurer. So now insurance risk, now that is to cover those risks. So what is this insurance risk? Insurance risk means a threat or a peril that the insurance company has agreed to cover up in case of occurrence of that apprehended or unapprehended risk of peril. Um, before we move further, you're encouraged to ask questions just in case you do not understand towards the end of the class. Well, coming back to this. So there are an you know, eclectic range of happenings that are considered insurance risks. For example, death of a person is a life insurance risk that is covered under the life insurance policy. Or motor vehicle accident is an auto risk, which is covered under the auto or motor vehicle insurance, etc. So insurance sector comprises of companies that sell insurance policies and collects deposits in the form of premiums, which may be released at the culmination of the policy, that is towards the end of the policy, at the occurrence of a particular risk, which the policy seeks to Cover. So it would be one of it, either at the culmination of a policy, depending upon the type of insurance policy it is, or at the occurrence of a particular risk, which the policy seeks to cover. Now, what are the features of risk? So how are these risks examined to be insurable? So what are these risks we are talking about? The risks that we are saying that we should cover these risks by insurance. What is it exactly? How, how can you ascertain those risks? Oh, how can you categorize it as a risk? So for it to be categorically called as a risk, it must be of some value. It should be calculable and significant enough to be able to be calculated. Next is the risk transfer must be within an affordable bracket. That means it should be a particular affordable sum. Next is the risk sought to be insured must be characteristically straightforward and definable to the extent that it supports objective verification. Next is risk must be unintended and assumable. That means it should not be planned the risk. It should not be something that a person plans and says, okay, I'm going to insurance this particular property and I'm going to destroy it and then going to, I'm going to claim it from the insurance company. So that amounts to fraud. So it should not be something that is planned and then they you know, seek uh, coverage of those losses. Next is in order to be considered as a risk losses must be direct it may be direct or indirect and direct losses it refers to destruction of the property or a person itself and indirect refers to a consequential loss as a result of the direct loss in case of a damage to a third party that refers to liability risk where the loss is caused by the actions of the insured and the policy holder thereby Risks are uncertain and unintentional where the concepts of probability and possibility come to the fore. That is, it, it is probably or possibly an event that comes to the fore. Next is, how does insurance work? What is the nature of insurance? Now, basically, insurance is a risk management tool to hedge risks and losses. That is, to hedge or to cover up or to, you know, uh, protect against risks and losses. So if you have, if you look at, uh, you know, one angle, one, one angle of it would be the societal angle. Now the risk transfer mechanism of insurance works in a way that it collects premium to pool resources and then disburse them to those who are part of their policy at the right time of their need. Next is a personal angle or a private angle. So you could study the nature of insurance from the societal point of view next as 
you know, a pr from the personal point of view, a private angle. So unfortunate situations are covered by insurance policies. So it also operates as a pecuniary tool or a financial tool or something related to money to combat the blow of an unfortunate event that has impacted the life, body, property of the policyholder. Insurance schemes operate as bifurcated into social insurance schemes and private insurance schemes. So insurance schemes, broadly speaking, you could, you know, divide them into categorically social insurance scheme and private insurance scheme. Apart from that, of course, you have corporate insurance as well. Next is risk transfer. What is risk transfer? Risk transfer is a foundational precept of most insurance transactions, wherein risk transfer of specific risk is comprehensively outlined and defined. And that defined risk is passed on from one party that is insured, the insurance policy holder, to the insurer, the insurance company who covenants to take the risk by executing an insurance contract and binding the insured to the terms of the policy. I'm repeating this. Now, what is the main aspect here is the foundational part of it is there is a risk transfer when it comes to insurance. Are you understanding me? So insurance, the purpose of insurance itself is protection against those risks. So when a person purchases an insurance, let me put it this way. When a person purchases an insurance policy, he, he or she is basically trying to transfer that risk to whom? To the insurance company. So there is a risk transfer. So the risk transfer is a foundational part of most insurance transactions, right or wrong? That means there is a risk transfer of a particular risk, whatever is the insurance policy. For example, accident. So accident is a risk, right? So life insurance policy, so life, uh, you know, death is a risk. Are you understanding this? So risk transfer is a foundational precept of most insurance transactions where in risk transfer, a specific risk is comprehensively outlined and defined and that defined risk is passed on from one party to the other. Who is the party? The insured. For example, you are the one who wants to insure your car. Say you, let me call you Miss A or Mr. A. So your name is Mr. A, whoever you are. So say you're Mr. A and you want to insure your car. So you are the one who is the insurer. The insured product or the item or the property is your car. You're going to the insurance company. That means that is the party who is insuring, giving you that insurance for a particular fee that is insurance fee that is in the, you could call it as a premium. So for a consideration when you talk in terms of a contract, right? So what are you apprehending? You're apprehending a particular risk. You are afraid of a particular risk. So to cover the risk, you are approaching the insurance company. So basically what you're trying to do is transfer the risk upon the insurance company and you keep paying a particular premium that in case a particular event takes place, then the insurance company is going to come enter the scene and it's going to cover the loss for you, whatever loss that you have incurred. So this, this is the entire transaction in simple terms. So there is a risk transfer, okay, of a defined risk that is passed on from one party to insure the insurance policy holder to the insurer, that is insured company, who covenants to take the risk by executing an insurance contract and binding the insurer to the terms of the policy. That is, the, you are going to enter into a particular contract with them and bind yourself to the insurance policy, that contract with the insurance policy contract. Next is the insurance policy coverage must be real. It must be real. It may, I mean, it must not be something that is Im something subject to imagination. That should be something existing. There is an interesting case law here that is a Booth versus National Union Fire Insurance Company. And the citation of it, you can see there on the screen, 4500NJ Super 400-410. That is what which was adjudicated by the Appellate Division 2017, that is in the year 2017. Here, the court observed that the expectations of coverage must be real and objectively reasonable. In assessing the reasonable expectations of the insured, the court will consider communications regarding coverage between the insured or its broker and the insurer or its agent that relate to the insured's expectation, whether the scope of coverage is so narrow that it would largely nullify the insurance and defeat the purpose for which it was obtained. And if the policy unrealistically 
narrows the coverage that is causes broad injury to the public at large that requires the court to preclude enforcement on public policy grounds. So this is an interesting case. You can just mention it whenever a question is asked on the nature of insurance. So basically, we're talking about risk pooling, and the factor of risk pooling refers to the creation of large groups of similar risks. So what happens? So here, what we're talking about risk pooling. So that's how the insurance company comes up with, uh, you know, insuring the losses or covering up the losses. How? Like, for example, you are Mr. A, you purchase insurance policy. Then there is Mr. B, Mr. C, and so on, n number of people who are there, and they purchase the insurance policy. They purchase insurance policy. So all these resources, you're paying premiums. All these premiums are gathered together, right? So there is pooling, this risk pooling and the pooling of premium as well. So the factor of risk pooling refers to the creation of large group of similar risks. Now, all insurance is based on the concept of wager. That is a happening of an unknown event. The courts have developed the concept of insurable interest to constrain the concept of wager to appropriate it to a purposeful concept of legally covering pecuniary losses that is covering financial losses. Thereby, an insurable interest, what is insurable interest? The insurable interest is the legal right to enter into an insurance contract. I'm repeating, insurable interest is the legal right to enter into an insurance contract. A person or entity is said to have an insurable interest if the event insured against could cause that individual company a financial loss. Now, this insurable interest can be fortified or strengthened by a valid contract, which exemplifies the right of the party to claim for the losses incurred, which are covered in the relevant insurance policy obtained by the insured. There's yet another interesting case of Hyman versus Sun Insurance Company. Here, the court referred to the case of Farmers Mutual Fire Insurance Company, and uh, we're just quoting the observation here. It said that other courts have looked at insurable interests with respect to property, as whether the insured has such a right, title, or interest therein, or relation thereto, that he will be benefited by its preservation and continued existence, or suffer a direct pecuniary loss, or to suffer a direct financial loss, from its destruction or injury by the peril insured against. Now, yet another case is shock mail versus NJ Reality Title Insurance Company. Here, the court observed that the law's requirement that an insured or the beneficiary of the policy have a recognizably defined interest in life or property prevents socially discouraged wagering arson or other destruction of property, it limits indemnity to actual loss and produces potential risk to physical well-being or life. This is uh, just the court's observation. You'll have to just mention these case laws for your answer in case a question comes for your exam. Now, next important factor in an insurance policy or, you know, when you're in an insurance contract, rather, would be utmost good faith. That means insurance contracts, it revolves around the principle of utmost good faith. That means it is necessary that all relevant material information has to be disclosed by both the parties to the contract. The party who proposes insurance has a legal obligation to disclose all material facts that are relevant to the subject matter of insurance. The next thing is insurance contracts are contingent contracts. Why are we calling them contingent contracts? That means it is contingent upon happening of a particular event, an unforeseen event or apprehension of an unforeseen event, which may and may not be or may not be predicted, thereby they are referred to as contingent contracts. That means the insurance policy will be released upon happening of the particular event. Next is principle of subrogation. So what is this principle of subrogation? Taking over of the insured's right by the insurer is called subrogation. In simple terms, when the insurance company disburses the amount to the insured and the insured tries to make a claim case, where, for instance, through the code of law, they're in such a situation, the amount of claim will be subrogated to the insurance company, the insurer, to the extent of the amount disbursed to the insured under the relevant insurance scheme. Next is principle of contribution. Now, 
this simply means that, uh, you know, there is this right of the insurance company that is the insurer to recover a proportionate amount from other insurance companies, other insurers, under whose scheme the insured is covered. They have, suppose the person is having more than one insurance policy. So, you know, the insurance company can take the benefit of the principle of contribution and ask the other insurance companies also to contribute to a dispersal or covering of a particular loss proportionately. Thereby here, the insurance collectively on the different policies contribute to indemnifying the loss or covering the loss of the insured. Next is principle of proximate cause. This is a very, very important principle. Again, part of the nature of insurance policy and insurance contract on what grounds the, the, uh, the policy insurance or insurance contract works. This is one of the principle, principle of proximate cause or the closest cause. This concept considers the cause of the loss that is most proximate to the clause, that is to the loss, that is most closest to the loss, the most proximate to the loss. So it examines causation. What is causation? Cause and effect. Causation is a relationship between cause and effect. You can see that on the screen. I've written there, it examines causation. What is causation? That is cause effect. Cause and the effect. Cause of the incident, effect of the incident. Cause of the in incident, example, fire. Effect of the incident is damage caused by fire. So it examines causation and the nexus or the relationship between the cause of the loss and the loss itself in order to conclude on the dispersal of insurance claim. Now, if a loss to an insured property is a result of two or more concurrent causes or has occurred in succession, such a situation mandates the examination of the most proximate cause. That is, what is the closest cause out of the several underlying clauses, causes? That is, out of the several uh, different causes that are existing apart from the closest proximate cause. That means they're going to test which is the most closest cause of you know the loss what why why has this loss occurred or oh, how is it occurred what is the closest cause so that is called the most proximate cause of the loss so claims in which the losses are remotely connected to the cause under which the policy is covered would be rejected Next is law of large numbers. This is again an interesting principle of insurance law. Law of large numbers is an interesting principle which covers insurance policies collectively of a group of policyholders. The principle is also called as a law of averages and more clearly, the law of large numbers refers to the statistical axiom which states that the larger the number of exposure units independently exposed to loss, the greater is the probability that the actual loss experience will E will equally expect will be equally expected to be covered by the loss experience. So this was actually, uh, you know, written by International Risk Management Institute. That is, it concurred with this philosophy of large of law of large numbers, where it states that the law of large numbers refers to the statistical axiom. It states that larger the number of exposure units independently exposed to loss, the greater is the probability that the actual loss experience will equal expected loss experience. Now, next is the principle of adhesion. That is, insurance policies are contracts of adhesion. We call insurance policy contracts as contracts of adhesion. That is, they are construed liberally by the courts, and they are contracts that are drawn without any right of negotiation. So that's why we call them as the contracts of adhesion, because there is no much scope really of negotiating the terms, you know, in insurance contracts. That's why we call them as contracts of adhesion and the insured must accept the terms of the policy. Next is the principle of fortuity. The principle implies that the inherent factor of any insurance bargain is to, in, to interchange a risk of future probable impending loss for the certainty of a premium. Next is insurance policy itself. Let's refer to the case of Flomafet versus Cardiello. That is a case of New Jersey. This court observed that an insurance policy is a contract enforced as written when its terms are clear in order that the expectations of the parties will be clear, will be fulfilled. So one of uh, you know, the primarily uh, primary aspect that has to be considered here is an insurance policy contract has to be you know 
clearly worded. It has to be, the terms have to be clear enough so as to fulfill the expectation of both the parties that are involved, that is the insurer and the insured. As all contracts and laws are subject to interpretation to understand the spirit of the letter in the clause, likewise, insurance contracts are interpreted by the courts of law in insurance cases. Insurance policies being contracts of adhesion. I told you earlier what's contract of adhesion. What's contract of adhesion? I want you to recall to mind. Contracts of adhesion are contracts where there is little or no scope of negotiation. So insurance policies being contracts of adhesion are construed liberally. Construed liberally. That means they're interpreted liberally. Contracts of adhesion are contracts that are drawn without any right of negotiating the terms, just as an insurance contract insured has to accept the terms of the policy. Next is regulation of insurance. What is or how to be regulated depending upon the jurisdiction, the country, the, you know, the city or whatever, the jurisdiction. Uh, that there are various insurance laws, different legislations, different laws, codes that are prevalent domestically as well as reflected in international mandates, which needs to be adhered to. Now, in Union Labor Life Insurance Company versus Pyrino, that is again a US case that I've cited here, the US Supreme Court has observed that the business of insurance must meet a three part test. Now, this is important. One is the activity involves underwriting or spreading of risk. Two, the activity is an important part of the insured-insured relationship. And three, the activity is limited to um, entities within the insurance industry. So this is all for today's class. Uh, just because today's first class, I have just dealt with the introductory part of insurance. So we have learned about the introduction. What is insurance really? So just, uh, you know, if, uh, if you surmise the entire stuff, what we spoke about is insurance law is basically a collection of laws and regulations that relate to insurance. And what is this insurance? We are when we are talking about law, when, when you are a law student, we are talking about insurance as a contract between two parties. That is the insurance company, of course, who is the insurer and the insured. That is a party who has obtained the insurance policy. Here, basically what happens here is there is a risk transfer. It transfers the risk of loss to the other party, primarily the insurance company in the contract for a fee. That is for an exchange of a fee. There is a consideration. Uh, in the form of a fee and we call it as premium. So insurance laws and regulations basically manage and control how insurance contracts are formed, how they're enforced and uh, talking about offering it for or buying or selling and claim processes and so on. So what do insurance laws basically regulate? It could be anything, it could be individual, it could be companies, it could be um, say for example, car and so on, it could be anything. So this is all about insurance in brief, which is a type of risk management where the risk of a loss is transferred from one party to another through a payment of a premium. And what is the nature? We, we study the nature as well. The nature that is, uh, we spoke about how does it work? What is the nature of insurance? We spoke about it from the angle of the uh, society or a personal angle. And we also said that insurance schemes can be broadly classified into social insurance scheme and private insurance scheme. We spoke about certain case laws. We spoke about risk pooling. And the principle, the foundational principles of insurance is insurable interest, which is very important that you understand. Insurable interest is nothing but the relationship between the insured and the subject matter of insurance. The relationship between whom? Say, for I gave a simple example about you insuring your car. So what's insurable interest here is a relationship between you and the car. Mind you, you must understand this principle because the assignment that is given to you is based on this principle. There's a clue that I can give you right now. So insurable interest. So you are, I'm repeating it for you, you have obtained the insurance policy for your car. So what is the insurable interest here? The insurable interest here is the relationship or the nexus between you as the insured and the subject matter of insurance that is the car. Well, so insurable interest is a foundational principle. And when the court 
examines any case of insurance, it will and will and will examine the existence of insurable interest, that is a relationship between the party who has filed the claim to the insured object or the object uh, that has been insured and been or has been destroyed, for example, by fire or accident or whatever it may be. So this is insurable interest. So this is very important, repeating again for you, this concept is important for your first assignment, which has to be submitted within one week's time from today. Next is all insurance is based upon the concept of wager that is contingent upon happening of a particular event. Then I've cited a case law, Hyman versus Sun Insurance Company, and yet another case law that the shot mayor versus NJ Realty. Then we spoke about principle in principle of indemnity. Principle of indemnity again, it's a you know, again, a very important principle that is a significant principle of insurance. That is a principle of indemnity that is to make good the loss of a loss. Who makes good the loss? It is the insurance company upon the happening of a particular event. Next is the principle of assurance. Next is principle of subrogation, principle of contribution, principle of proximate cause, that is the closest cause of the loss. Uh, I've spoken about the causation theory, then law of large numbers, principle of adhesion. What is principle of adhesion? That I, I said that um, uh, insurance policies can be considered as contracts of adhesion. That means there is little or no scope for negotiation, the insured must accept the terms of the policy. And last one I spoke about is the principle of fortuity. So when you are asked a question on the nature of insurance, you are to give me the definition of insurance, the meaning of insurance, explain the meaning, and then write down all the principles, 11 principles that we have discussed today, along with the case laws. And this is a very important question, examination point of view. Next, I just spoke about the regulation of insurance. So that's all for today's class. And in case you have any question, you can ask me. Please write your names in the chat box so as to enable me to mark your attendance, please. Do you have any questions? If not, we will wind up and we will meet the next class at the same time. We are new for insurance. Well, please explain about assignment yes i spoke with the assignment in the beginning of the class there i'll be uploading a um you know i'll be uploading a video on that um um if you want uh, so so one of the concepts for about the assignment that we have studied today is a concept of insurable interest right and uh, i'll upload the video on your assignment and some introductory part of the class like about your uh, you know your course description and so on i'll do that any other question see um one clue i can give you for this class is if you follow my lectures and uh, as i've assured you that i'll be even uploading some study notes for you just to help you and uh, while we proceed with the class i will be giving you some hints on important questions, examination point of view. So that's going to help you. And please pay attention um, on the assignments, on the submission of assignments on time, because there you can grab maximum marks. So I don't mind even allotting maximum marks to the student who, you know, uh, you know submits the assignment on time. And there should not be plagiarism that is cut, copy, paste from any online resource material and so on. So please go by the guidelines that are appended to your assignment question. Go by that and grab maximum marks. So that's all about today. And we will meet you again. We'll meet each other next class. That is next Monday, same time. Please write your names in the chat box, please. I'll go by this to the board attendance.